Hello everyone and welcome to the Ramen Otaku Show. Today's episode... We're gonna be breaking down and analyzing the cultural origins of Inazuma. Um, who are you? I'm Gaijin Gumdrop, the cultural analysis man. <sighs> this is what I get for basing monsters off of Mario enemies. Well don't just stand there and do nothing. Gaijin Goomba hasn't made a culture shock video on Genshin Impact. Which, what the fuck is wrong with this dude? Because this game is loaded with cultural references. We gotta get on this shit like sticky honey roast! Okay, okay, I mean, you're right about Gaijin Goomba not doing a Genshin video, but I'm sure he has his reasons. So, it seems like always, we gotta take up the reins and do the work ourselves. Before we begin, I don't think I need to tell you this, but this video contains massive spoilers from the prologue to the end of Chapter 2's Archon Quest. So if you haven't gotten to that point, now's your chance to leave the video. Other than that, enjoy our culture shock. Let's start off with the name. So Inazuma literally means lightning in Japanese. But what does lightning symbolize in Japanese culture? Well, we'll get to that later, but right now I want to focus on the third Archon Quest's main plot point the Sokoku Degree. This policy ran from 1603 to 1853. This limited foreign relations and trading between Japan and other countries, as well as preventing the Japanese from leaving the country. Now that's not to say that Japan had to rely solely on its own resources. Japan did at least do some extensive trade with China. Oh, so that explains how Beidou was able to take the Traveler to Inazuma. Exactly. And just like in Genshin Impact, there were severe consequences to anyone who opposed this edit. Many attempts to end Japan's seclusion were made by expanding Western powers during the 17th to 19th century, which includes American, Russian, and French ships trying to engage in a relation with Japan. But all of them were ended up being rejected. It wasn't until July 8, 1853 that Matthew Perry of the U.S. Navy demanded Japan to open trade with the West. But what about the Fatui and Russia? In the Archon Quest, it's revealed that the Fatui actually caused both the Sokoku Degree and the Vision Hunt Decree. Did Russia do something similar to Japan that caused it to close its borders? Actually, no. Russia had nothing to do with the Sokoku Degree. I know I mentioned Russian ships, but I don't think Russia was the one pulling the strings in Japan's seclusion. Plus, I'm pretty sure that any foreigner who set foot on Japan at the time of the Decree would have been either imprisoned or worse, killed. Wow, that certainly sounds devastating. Well, I could be paraphrasing a little bit. Alright, now that we got that out of the way, let's get to the good stuff. The characters. And we'll start off with my absolute favorite, Kazuha. What's so special about him? He just looks like your typical wandering samurai to me. Well, let me start from the beginning. So his name Kazuha means a myriad of leaves, while his last name, Kaidahara, means maple groove. And of course, his constellation is the scientific name for the Japanese maple leaf. But what's so special about maple leaves? Well, from what I found, Japanese maple symbolizes elegance, beauty, and grace. It is said that the turning of the colors on the tree is a highly anticipated yearly event that brings many tourists out to Japan's national parks and temples to admire. And since Kazuha is a wandering samurai, along with the fact that he likes his food to be well prepared, it seems to make all the sense that the Japanese maple would symbolize him best. Next on the list of my favorites is Ayaka Kamisato. So for her name, Ayaka means silk flower, while her last name, Kamisato, means god village, or god's origin. Now this might seem far-fetched, but I feel like Mahoyo may have given her that surname in reference to being one of the first characters available in the closed beta test. She could possibly be one of the earliest characters that Mahoyo worked on before the concept of Ether and Lumine. But I'm just speculating here. Okay, but what about her constellation and her title? Shirasagi Himigimi. Well, both her constellation and title seems to be related to one thing. The Japanese folk character, Sagi Musume. She is a heron, or crane in some cases, that turns into a maid. It's also the name of a traditional kabuki dance. Oh, I get it. So that's why she was dancing in the river. Yes, aside from the fact that she got her socks wet, but it's fine. But that's not all I wanted to talk about for Ayaka. She does remind me of a particular yokai. Oh, I know what you're talking about! The Yukiona! That's correct! Yukiona are beautiful women with bodies that are as cold as ice. They spend their undead lives hunting humans in the snow, cloaking themselves in ice, and freezing them to death. Ayaka's alternate sprint certainly does fit the description of cloaking themselves in ice, though the hostile part is probably more similar to the Fatui Cryo Sinsen mages. 
However, not every Yukiona is cold-blooded, per se. Some legends say that they can fall in love, let their intended prey go free, or even marry them and live happily ever after. Now, even though this game doesn't have any romance, it is shown that while Ayaka is the embodiment of perfection, she is shown to be quite lonely and longs for some friends, as seen in her story quest. And it's so wholesome, you guys! Alright, let's move on to the next character, shall we? Next on the list is Yoimiya. Her name means Last Evening Shrine, referring to the evening of the main festival event, which of course is when they display the fireworks. Now even though this is pretty obvious, I should point out that using fire arrows and dangerous fireworks isn't that uncommon in Japan. It's actually a ninja thing. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, so let's focus on the one thing she loves the most, which is Japanese festivals or Matsudes. So jumping back to Ayaka's story quest, we're first greeted with a mask vendor. Now mask vendors are pretty common, most particularly with summer festivals. The masks can range from either Kitsune, Oni, Tengu, etc. You'll also notice those strange looking ghost dolls hanging next to the stall. Those are Teru Teru Bozu, which means Shine Shine Monk. These handmade dolls were made to bring good weather and prevent rainy days. Next is the fortune slips, or as they're called, Omikuji, and they're mostly common within Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples. Even the way and how you draw fortune slips from the cylinder is very identical to the real one. Next is the food stalls, and boy, they are everywhere in Matsudes. And they sell a ton of snacks, which of course includes dango, egg rolls, and sakura mochis. And finally, the prayer racks. Now, it is true that you can either write or draw out your wish on these wooden racks, but this is more of a New Year's tradition. Nevertheless, a tradition is a tradition. Okay, wait. Can we go back to Yoimiya and find out what does goldfish have to do with her and festivals? Well, that would be the Japanese goldfish catching game, of course. You essentially have to scoop the goldfish into your bowl with a paper scoop called a poi. What? But isn't that difficult? Yes. Yes, it is difficult. All right, now let's get a little witch ninja and move on to Sayu. Some ninja are really quite good. Then there are some I never understood. Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? Hey, everybody, witch ninja! Let's start off with her appearance. So as you should know, real ninja wear dark blue. In Sayu's case, she isn't wearing blue. However, she's dressed like a Mujina, which is an old Japanese term that refers to Japanese badgers, not tanukis though they do bear traits similar to them in folklore. So I'll give Sayu some credit in disguising herself as an animal yokai. Next, ninjas usually wear masks. Now in her character design, she does wear a hood, which I guess is close enough. However, one of the Inazuma artifacts called Capricious Visage, which is basically just a kitsune mask, is something you could equip on her. Ninjas sometimes wear kitsune or oni masks, not only to hide their face, but also to jump scare their victims. Next, ninjas are usually small and lightweight, as it makes it easier for them to traverse without making any noise. This is one of the few things that Sayu gets right in terms of being a ninja. It's just a shame that she wants to be taller. Oh, and one thing I should point out before I get any dumbass comments is about her age. But you know what? It would be pointless of me trying to explain this, because you'll just think I'm bullshitting you. So instead, I'm just gonna let Gaijin Goomba explain this. Again. Let me start off by saying that according to Japan's laws, under Article 177 of its constitution, the age of consent for sexual activity is 13 years old. 13 years old. There are of course exceptions of this age from prefecture to prefecture, with many of Tokyo's wards actually having an age of consent as high as 17, but I have not seen higher. So, in accordance to their own laws and regulations, high school age isn't so far-fetched. Also in China, the legal age for sexual consent is 14 years old. So, not really that far off in my opinion. Now granted, we don't exactly know Sayu's age, well, I mean, we don't know a majority of the character's age, but we could assume that she's at least 13 to 14 years old. And lastly, ninjas carry lightweight weapons, like Kodachis, Yumis, etc. Now in her trailer, she's shown wielding the Debate Club. Now even though the Debate Club is a weapon from Liwa, clubs are actually a Japanese weapon wielded by Oni. But Ninjas normally don't wield such heavy weaponry. Now even though her animal vision does help her lift it with ease, still, realistically, this is not something a ninja should be wielding. Say, don't ninjas have a specific way of sleeping? 
actually, they do! Ninjas typically sleep on their left side to protect their heart from enemy attacks. Now, we haven't really seen Sayu sleeping on her left side. But, if she wants to be a wise ninja, it would be best of her to sleep on her left side. Unless she wants to get stabbed by a treasure hoarder, a Fatui agent, or worse, a Karage. Okay, so what about her elemental skill in Burst? I mean, what's up with the Daruma doll? And how is it able to heal her allies? Well, I guess I should explain the Daruma doll first. When you purchase a Daruma doll, their eyes start off blank. The user will then select a goal or wish, and paint in the left eye. Once their desired goal is achieved, the right eye is then filled in. Since both eyes are painted in, it seems to imply that her goal has been fulfilled. But what goal is that exactly? It's certainly not to be taller, maybe to be the best ninja? It could possibly be just an aesthetic choice. Now as for the healing ability, ninjas are capable of producing medicine. Hunger and thirst control, painkillers, and even wake up aids. They sure made a ton of medicine to help them in their mission. So it does make sense that Sayu would have this ability to heal her allies. And who knows, maybe the Daruma doll has all the medicine packed inside of it. And as for her elemental skill, it could be a very loose reference to how ninjas utilize the five elements to escape. Though in Sayu's case, it's only four elements, and mostly used for either combat or traversal. Finally, I want to end this section off with what the Yuhu Arts is. Now, Yuhu is a word that is an interjection to express sorrow, regret, compassion, or grief. Similar to, alas! Maybe the Shumatsubatsu clan isn't actually the best ninja clan, but who knows? Honestly, as a ninja, I give Seiyu a 7 out of 10 shurikens. She may not be the most accurate ninja, but she's still the most useful. Not to mention adorable. Next we have Kujo Sara, and right off the bat the game straight up tells you that she is a Tengu. Tengus, which translates to Heavenly Dog or Heavenly Sentinel, are considered a type of Yokai or Shinto God. They're usually depicted as either ravens or red goblins with long noses. This is evident with her mask and the black wings she sometimes shows. Some Tengu are portrayed as troublemakers, but there are Tengu who are portrayed as protective deities, similar to how she remains loyal to the Shogun. This is also evident in her design, where she's dressed like a Japanese priestess, and even how she wields a Yumi. The only thing that doesn't make her an accurate Tengu is her electrovision. Tengus usually have the ability to manipulate winds, not storms, so it's pretty perplexing that she's shown to have an electrovision. Maybe to show her loyalty to the Shogun? Well, why don't we move on to a character that's more accurate to her source material? The Divine Priestess herself, Sanganomiya Kokomi. And while many of you will probably brush her off as being simply a mermaid princess, she actually draws a few parallels to ancient Japanese folklore and history. Now, of course, her name is pretty obvious. Kokomi meaning Mind Sea, which is comparable to the beating of the heart within the rippling of the sea, and Sanganomiya meaning Coral Shrine. And the yokai she's most likely based on is the ningyo, which are essentially Japanese mermaids, or fishes with human faces. One thing to note is that ningyo are sometimes responsible for causing tidal waves, which may explain Kokomi's attacks even further. Another thing to note is that eating ningyo flesh will grant eternal life and youth. Perhaps that's the reason why Kokomi has such a youthful appearance. But what really makes her amazing is how Kokomi could also be based on Otohime, from the Japanese folklore Urashima Taro. The folklore is about a fisherman named Taro who rescues a turtle and takes him to the Dragon Palace beneath the sea. Their princess Otohime gives him a forbidden box as a reward. He spends what he believes to be several days with the princess, but when he returns to his home village, he discovers that he's been gone for 100 years. And when he opens the forbidden box, he turns into an old man. So what does this have to do with Kokomi? Well, in Act 2, the Traveler comes to the aid of the Resistance in their darkest moment. After the confrontation and victory on the beach, they're invited to Watatsumi Island, and Kokomi makes them a platoon captain. And when you consider that Kokomi is also the ruler of Watatsumi Island, which has an ocean theme similar to the Dragon Palace, it makes all the sense in the world that she would draw parallels to Otohime. But that's not all, folks. It gets even better. Her resistance clan mirrors that of the Tsuchigamori clan. In this ancient civil war, there were two groups, one who was loyal to the emperor and one who had their own ideas and beliefs. Very similar to how both the resistance and the shogun's army waged war in the Vision Hunt Decree. 
Okay, but who and what is their god Orobashi supposed to be anyway? Well, that would be the Yamata no Oroshi, of course. I mean, come on, their names are pretty similar. So to try to make this short, Yamata no Orochi was a giant serpent who was eating an old couple's daughters. The Shinto god of storms, Susano, agreed to help the old couple protect their eighth and last daughter, and devised a plan to slay the beast, which was to make it drunk with liquor. After the serpent was sliced into pieces, Susano found three items inside the beast, which was the legendary sword Kusanagi no Tsurugi, the Yata no Kagami mirror, and the Yasakani no Magatama jewel. And oh boy, doesn't that look familiar. You can even see on the island that the serpent was cut into pieces just like Orochi. And that's why we love Kokomi so much! She's so cute and badass! Now we're gonna save the Raiden Shogun for last. So instead, let's talk about some of the food, items, and quests that are native to Inazuma, which mirrors that of Japan. So let's start off with the question of, why is there pizza in Japan? Well, there's a few reasonings to this. The first one being the popularity of okonomiyaki, which is a Japanese pizza or pancake with toppings on top. Oh, like the food item more and more, right? Exactly. Okay, but seriously, what is it with Japanese and pizza? Well, it's pretty simple. Japanese people actually love pizza. And of course, it was the inspiration for the video game legend himself, Pac-Man. Okay, enough with the video game jokes. What about the lavender melon? What do they have to do with Japan? Well, this is going to be difficult to explain. First off, lavender melon is not a real thing. However, its Japanese name, Smile Uri, does give us a clue, but not entirely Japanese. Smile Uri refers to the flower Viola Manchurica, which is a species of violets and are native to Asia. They do have culinary uses, which are used to make Hawajin, which are flower pancakes. But unfortunately, it's a Korean dish, not a Japanese dish. Okay, so what about the fishes? In the local fish shop, you need to catch some pufferfish and koi fish for the weapon, the catch. Well, first off, that is not a pufferfish. It's a catfish. This is a pufferfish. Now granted, the description does say that they're dangerous to eat, which is also true. Pufferfishes are a Japanese dish, if prepared right. So, why the catfish design? Well, even though it's not native to Japan, there is such a thing as electric catfish, which would make sense in the land of Inazuma. Now as for the koi fish and why they look like dragons, koi fishes are known as the symbol of eternity in Asia, as they can live very long and are immune to most fish disease. And there's also a Chinese legend of if a koi fish can swim up the Yellow River and leap over the Dragon's Gate, they can turn into a powerful dragon. Makes sense in the land of eternity, right? What about the Oni Kabuto? Well, they're obviously Kabuto beetles. And Japanese kids love to collect them, raise them, and even have them square off each other. Which of course became the inspiration for Pokemon. And what about the Shiba Inu? Why does the Shogun love them so much? Well, Shiba Inus are mostly good-natured hunting dogs who are bold and fierce, but very lovable and well-mannered pets. Now let's talk about some of the quests and what cultural references it hides within its gameplay. First off, the Seventh Samurai quest is in reference to the Chanbara films, which are samurai films. Basically, think of it like Pirates of the Caribbean, but samurais. Next, the Temari from Kid Kujirai's challenges are handballs crafted from old kimono remnants. And finally, for the Solitary Sea Beast quest, let's talk about the Umibozu, which means Sea Priest. Even though the quest paints the Umibozu as a friendly creature, it's actually quite the opposite. These yokai are known for destroying ships and sinking them into the sea. Some depictions say they're either a giant monster or a serpent, not a whale per se. Okay, so now that all the boring stuff is out of the way, let's get to the nit and gritty stuff. The enemies! Let's start off with the Spectre enemies, which are obviously based on the will o -Wisp. Even though they aren't native to Japan, they are still common within Japanese folklore. Next is the Nobushi and Kairagi. Now, I'm all for fighting these guys, even if they're a little bit difficult, but one thing I found very weird about them was their voice. The description claims that they're wandering samurais who have fallen into banditry, but answer me this. Does this sound like a normal bandit to you? <laughs> You think you can get your stuff back with this bunch? You must be dreaming. <laughs> no, 
No, it doesn't. It sounds like they're being possessed by a demon. You know, it reminds me of a particular yokai called the Amori. They're the ghosts of dead warriors that have either transformed into or possessed geckos and haunt forgotten overgrown ruins where they've lost their lives and attack trespassers. While the Nobushi and Kalagi don't take on the appearance of geckos, they do attack trespassers. Next is the Mirror Maiden. At first, it looked like Mahoyo took inspiration from my character Barrage Maiden, which may be true in some form. There are two yokai that may have served as the inspiration for the Mirror Maidens, one of which Mirage Maiden does share. The first yokai being the Ame Ona, which translates to Rain Woman. Ame Ona are known for summoning rain wherever they go and kidnapping children. Mothers who have had their babies snatched away from them sometimes also transform into Ame Ona out of grief and despair roaming the streets at night, kidnapping, crying children to replace what was once stolen to them. While the Mirror Maidens don't look as depressed as the Yokai, they do summon water as their attacks. And the second Yokai being the Ungai Kyo, which is what Mirage Maiden is based on. These magic mirrors have various uses, which range from trapping spirits to fortune telling. Now you're probably wondering, what does this magic mirror have to do with water? Well, in order to make your very own Ungai Kyo, on the 15th day of August on the lunar calendar, you put a mirror into a bucket of water and then draw a face of a yokai, which it will then awaken. Finally, we come to the Magu Kinki. And oh boy, this guy is filled with cultural references. You people should know that Japan is a very technologically advanced country dating all the way back to the 17th century with its Karakuri puppets. These clockwork puppets can do basic tasks from serving tea to firing an arrow with cunning accuracy. Nowadays, you see Japanese scientists working on creating advanced AI, which would eventually lead to advanced androids. Another possible source could be the Bunraku, which is a form of traditional Japanese puppet theater. Though it's not exactly like your typical string puppets, but more like hand puppets. Alright, now that we're done with robotics, let's finally move on to the Raiden Shogun. Just to warn you guys, this is a very bizarre and confusing character, so try to stay with me because even I still can't understand what Mahoya was even thinking when creating her. But let's start simple. Shoguns actually have the most amount of power than the Emperor, which means Ai is actually more of an Emperor, while her puppet is more of the Shogun. So in the story, we learn that there are two twin gods named Ai and Makoto. Ai means flourish and prosperous, while Makoto means sincerity and truth. These twin gods are a direct reference to Raijin and Fujin, the Shinto gods of Japan. Raijin uses his drums to create thunder, while Fujin uses his bags to create wind. The two brothers would compete against each other to see who can outperform who, causing storms throughout Japan. In fact, the drums that appear behind Ai as well as the drums in the castle and in the military grounds are very similar to what Raijin has. But wait, Raijin is colored red, where Ai wears a purple attire. What's up with that? Actually, purple is considered to be the color for royalty in Japanese culture, so it would make all the sense in the world that the Raiden Shogun would be wearing purple. Now here's where things get confusing. First thing I need to point out is that Buzzlebee and Bal are not Japanese names, but in fact the names of demon lords. Buzzlebull is another name for Satan and is capable of flying, in which he is sometimes is known as the Lord of the Flies, while Bal is the god of storms and the first king of hell. Both of these names are closely associated together. Now what makes this very confusing is how the characters' roles have been swapped, with Makoto the Thunder God being deceased and I, the Wind God taking the place of the Thunder God. I understand that I took on the name Bao to honor her sister, but at the same time it's still confusing. And no, Raijin and Fujin didn't even have anything close to what the Raidens had in the game. So in reality, I should technically be an animal archon. Otherwise, Makoto should not have been the one to die. Okay, before we go any further, I want to know about Scaramouche. You know, the Balladeer, number six of the Fatui Harbinger. Oh yeah, I completely forgot about him. I guess I should cover that as well, even if he's just as bizarre and confusing as the Shogun. So just like the Shoguns, Scaramouche, which means Little Skirmisher, is actually not a Japanese name. It's not even a Russian name at all. It's actually a term derived from a stock character from Italian theater. These villainous character types are primarily known for being unprincipled and unreliable, but also having a curious mind. Well, what about his real name? Kunizuzushi. What does that mean? Oh boy, I don't think you're gonna like it. His real name, Kunizuzushi, literally means Country Destroyer. Whoa. Luckily though, he didn't destroy Inazuma, just attempted to. 
even though he was able to complete a part of the Cerita's plan for world domination. So, what about the hat he's wearing? Well, even though he doesn't wear a mask like the other Harbingers, the hat he's wearing could likely be an Ichimigasa. These hats not only protect him from the harsh weather, but even conceal one's identity. I mean, it could be a modified Kasa hat, but still... And his origin story? What about that? Well, it's a bit similar to what I said about Japanese robotics. But to make this short, it seems to be a reference to the series Ghost in the Shell, which even that has Jewish origins. I recommend checking out the Did You Know anime episode of Ghost in the Shell if you're curious. Okay, so we picked apart this puffin enough. Wasn't there something you wanted to say about Bao and Buzzleby? Oh yeah, this is gonna be a little game theorist, so sit tight. So I told you guys that I and Makoto are named after demon lords. The same applies with Venti and Zhongli, being Barbados and Morax respectively. I should also point out that Paimon is also of the same category, so it's possible that she could be the reason why and how the Traveler is able to utilize multiple elements. Granted, we don't know too much about Paimon or the Traveler's backstories aside from what was presented in the chapter, but I do feel like Paimon is the reason why and how the Traveler is able to utilize the elements without a vision. But back to the main Archons. So remember when Daneslip said that the gods were responsible for the destruction of Conria, and when our lost siblings said that they turned into the monsters of the abyss? Given the fact that the Archons are named after demon lords, it does seem fitting that a bunch of demon lords would cause the destruction of a nation. However, despite their names, they don't really act the part of demon lords. Why is that? Well, the Archons we've met so far haven't shown to be violent or malicious at all. Zhongli even refuses to give an answer about the events in the second act of his story quest. It's possible that the Archons were originally sadistic when they caused the destruction of Conria, but over time wanted to put the past behind them and turn over a new leaf. And honestly, I don't think it's that uncommon for God to do some messed up things. I mean, take a look at Zeus. He's done some pretty messed up things. From seducing multiple women to wiping out humanity with a great flood. Yet he's still a highly respected god in all of Greek mythology. So is the Abyss Order the true enemy of this game? Or is it the Archons? But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I don't know guys, I thought the Fatui was the most morally great part of the story, but after this, it blew my mind how this game could have an even bigger morally great story than I could have ever imagined. Even if the people of Conria are possibly barbaric scientists who love nothing more than fighting and killing like Almira, but more heartless. Well that wraps up this Culture Shock episode, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more Genshin Culture Shock videos, as I plan to make a part 2 of Inazuma, Fontaine, and possibly Snezunaya. But until next time everyone, this is Marcus Yamamoto, signing out.